Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Cricket South Africa's Level 2 umpiring course presented to you by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Tom Mukorosi. I am the training coordinator of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. Myself and my co-presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, who is the head of training of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, will be taking you through this course for the next six Saturdays, and then we shall go into physical handwritten exam. I will go through the details of the course and the exam in full on the next slide, but I will start with our meeting protocols. As you will have noticed, all of your microphones are on mute and your cameras are turned off while we present. We aim to finish presenting by 10 a.m. South African time, at which time we will go into revision questions. And during the revision questions, I will unmute all of your microphones and you will have the option to switch your cameras on because we want our question and answer sessions for the revision questions to be as interactive as possible. You will remember in level one that you guys were asking the questions. For level two, we will be asking you the questions and requiring input to help us answer those questions. While we present, you can jot down your questions in the meeting chat box so that you do not forget any questions. And while we're on the chat box, it's important for us to check that everybody can see the chat box and use the chat box. So just a little bit of early interaction, if I can ask you all to type in where you are in the world right now. So I would type in Cape Town, South Africa into the chat box. It's always interesting to know where our audience is based uh, so that we can use examples seen by you guys wherever you are in the world. The Indian Premier League started yesterday and so we'll be referring to along the way any examples that come out of that competition. But of course we know South Africa is also playing the Netherlands currently in a one day international series. So examples should be coming out of those particular tournaments as we go through our lectures. Uh, we might go over time during the question and answer sessions. You are welcome to leave at any time. As you know, all our sessions are recorded and will be loaded onto our YouTube page about two hours after every lecture. So if you are not able to attend all the lectures, not a problem. You can watch them in your own time and self-study to prepare for the exam. Also, we are running a promotion currently. Um, those of you who are not yet subscribers for our YouTube channel, please follow the link on the email that I sent you. Go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to the YouTube channel that will allow you 50 Rand discount or $3 discount on the exam fee. And on the next uh, slide, I will talk us through the exam logistics. Just by way of official introduction, there's a picture of uh, Abdullah in action with Tabrez Shamsi bowling and myself a few years ago with Simon Harmer bowling. We are both on the Cricket South African National Panel of Umpires, and we are both uh, accredited Cricket South Africa trainers as well. So this is the timetable for the course. You will notice that unlike level one, we are not going through all 42 laws of cricket. We are only covering the laws and only parts of those laws that are examined in the Cricket South Africa Level 2 exam. So today we will be going through laws 5, 9 and 11. 
and then next week Saturday we go through laws 12, 13, 14, 17. Following Saturday 18, 20, 21, 22, 24, then 27, 28, 30, 31. And then law lecture five will be laws 37, 40 and 41. And then lecture six, we're going to go through all the revision questions that we are going to be covering in lectures one to five. So quite important that you attend as many as you can, uh, but in terms of revision purposes, the best one to reference is lecture six, where we'll be combining all the revision questions from lectures one to five in one lecture for you to all be ready for your exam. So now how is the exam going to work? There are exam fees applicable and they differ for candidates. Members of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, the exam is free for all of you. So you just need to email me by the Thursday 11th of May telling me which exam sitting you are going to partake in and which format you will be writing your exam in. There are two options. There are two dates and two options per date. The first date will be Saturday the 13th of May at 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So the exam is a two hour exam and the sitting will be at Newlands Cricket Ground, most likely the media centre, which has uh, journalist desks where candidates can write on. Uh, or anyone, including people based in Cape Town, may write at home or in their office or at their school remotely being invigilated on Microsoft Teams. What will happen is we will email the answer sheets, a blank answer sheet for all of you to print out and use to write your answers. We are going to, on the morning of the Saturday, the 13th of May, we're going to have a Microsoft Teams call where everybody that wants to write remotely will log in. And this is going to happen on Monday evening as well. So the exact same process applies for both exam sittings. You choose either one of them, not both. And what happens is if you are writing remotely, we will, five minutes past nine, copy and paste the 24 questions in the level two exam into the chat box of that Microsoft Teams meeting, okay? And you will be viewing those questions on your computer, preferably, or your tablet, or worst case scenario, your phone, if you don't have a computer or a tablet. Um, it is not as easy on the phone because the text will be smaller. However, if you don't have any other option, then phone it must be. You will view the questions on the screen and you will write your answers on your exam answer sheet that you would have printed. We will email that exam answer sheet to all of those who are writing remotely uh, earlier in the week. Uh, that is why we need confirmation of your exam fees by Thursday so that Thursday night, I will email you all the exam sheet and then you can print it on Friday to be ready for your exam on Saturday or Monday. Once you are finished writing remotely, you will scan and email your answer sheet to myself and Abdullah. We'll give you those email addresses uh, closer to the time. And what's important there is you for the entire time need to have your camera on so that we can see that you're alone in the room and your microphone on so that we can hear that you're not getting any help from anyone. Uh, these regulations are required strictly so that we make sure that 
no cheating is involved in the exam. It is a closed book exam. Level one was an open book exam. Level two is a closed book exam. So no help from anybody and no material must be around you when you are answering your questions. Uh, for those of you who don't have scanners, not a problem. Most smartphones nowadays have apps where you can take pictures and put those pictures together into one PDF document. So if you don't know how to do that, please uh, practice. Get some help from a tech savvy friend who will know how to take numerous pictures and consolidate them into one PDF document. Uh, we will not be accepting exam scripts on 15 different WhatsApp uh, pictures. Uh, we will only be accepting exam answer sheets as one PDF emailed to myself and Abdullah. So that, as I mentioned, is uh, free for Western Province Cricket Umpires Association members. Uh, if you are a member of another umpires association in South Africa and you wish to write remotely with us, then you will need to pay us 100 rands and payment details, bank account details are sent on emails that I've sent to you. If you have not got any emails from me, um, I'm surprised that you're on this call, but uh, if you still need emails with bank account details, you can drop your email address in the chat box and I will send you the uh, all the details that I've just mentioned on email. Uh, it is the course material and meeting links email that I sent uh, last week, Saturday. Um, so if you don't know the details yet, it means you haven't read that email thoroughly. Please read all my emails thoroughly to save all of us time. Members of other associations in South Africa, if you don't want to pay and you want to write in your own association, I know, for example, that the Northwest Cricket Umpires, um, the president of that association called me last week, Saturday, and he wants Northwest umpires to write at the JB Marks Oval on a particular date that he will notify all of you. And uh, there, uh, no payment will be required to us. I don't know if um, they will be charging you guys to write at their particular venue. Um, so if you are not writing with us, you do not need to pay us anything. Uh, if you are writing remotely with us, then you need to pay that 100 rands. Candidates in South Africa who are not members of any umpires association, 300 rands needs to be paid on or before Thursday, the 11th of May at 1800. And candidates outside of South Africa, uh, please pay 30 US dollars via our PayPal account or 500 rands via the bank account details listed on the email. I hope that clears up the exam logistics. If there are any questions, um, we can take them at the end of this lecture. Uh, please let us keep the questions for every lecture specific to the laws that are being presented and also um, the exam logistics if you are still unsure of the exam logistics. Um, we don't want to open up the um, questions and answers to any and every question around cricket, otherwise we might never finish the lecture. OK. So moving on to today's laws, as I mentioned, we'll be covering laws 5, 9 and 11 and then going through revision questions. I am going to cover law 5, which is the bat, as you can see, and then Abdullah will take us through laws 9 and 11 and will also um, take us through the revision questions which are related to laws 5, 9 and 11 and these revision questions are taken from previous law level 2 and level 3 
Cricket South Africa umpiring exams, and a few of them are likely to be repeated in the exam that you are going to write. Uh, the exam that you're going to write uh, was put together in, I think, July 2021, and the revision questions come from 2017 and 2019 CSA Level 2 and CSA Level 3 exam papers. So uh, very important for you guys to get involved in trying to answer the revision questions because those are likely to come up again or at least similar questions in your Level 2 exam that we are preparing you for. So Level 5 is the bat and just keep in mind that we are only going through the laws that are examined in the level two exam, as well as only the parts of those laws which are examined. So there's the picture of a number of bats, different brands. And what's important to note is that the bat consists of two parts, a handle at the top and the blade, which is at the bottom. What does the law say about the handle? The handle is to be made principally of cane or wood. The part of the handle that is wholly outside of the blade is defined to be the upper portion of the handle. It is a straight shaft for holding the bat. I have come across some bats which are have handles that are not particularly round. They're more oval than round. Um, maybe they're suitable for some batters and some batters pre prefer them to round handles. Uh, I find them a little bit strange feel in the hand, um, but of course each to his or her own and different courses for different, oh, sorry, different horses for different courses, I think is the saying. Um, so the shape is not prescribed in the law. Uh, just the fact that it needs to be made principally of cane and or wood. And of course, the upper portion of the handle may be covered by a grip. What about the blade? The blade comprises the whole of the bat apart from the handle. And the blade shall consist solely of wood. Below we have a picture of uh, two umpires talking to Dennis Lilly back in December 1979 when he was using an aluminium bat in an Ashes test match against England. And most of the laws of cricket you will find were developed or at least added to after incidents such as this where Nothing was previously written about the material that a bat needs to be. So Dallas Lilly was well within his rights to come out and bat with an aluminium bat. Um, but soon after this incident, then it was written into the laws that the blade shall consist solely of wood. And I'm sure this was written into the law at the same time as well damage to the ball, is the bat allowed to do or make damage to the ball? Let's see what the law says. The law says that for any part of the bat covered or uncovered, the hardness of the materials and the surface texture thereof shall not be such that either could cause unacceptable damage to the ball. Unacceptable damage is any change that is greater than normal wear and tear caused by the ball striking the uncovered wood surface of the blade. Quite important for the exam is contact with the ball. And remember that contact with the ball allows for a catch to be taken. So when is the bat deemed to have made contact with the ball? 
Let's see what the law says. The law says that contact between the ball and any of the bat itself, the batter's hand holding the bat, and that is either hand that is holding the bat, any part of the glove worn on the batter's hand or hands holding the bat, and any additional materials permitted. So in the previous slide, it did mention that you are allowed materials on the bat, uh, like a grip, for example. So if the ball touches the grip that is protruding above the top of the handle, uh, and that ball flies off the top of that grip to the wicket keeper, then the batter will be out court because the grip being an additional material on the bat is considered part of the bat. And if the ball makes contact with that, that is considered as making contact with the ball. So any of these above shall be regarded as the ball striking or touching the bat or being struck by the bat. OK, that is my law for this morning. I will now hand over to Abdullah to take us through laws 9 and 11, and then we shall go into revision questions. Abdullah, I'm unsharing my screen so that you can share yours. Over to you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, good morning to you and good morning to the rest of the attendees. I'll be covering laws uh, 9 and 11 this morning. I'm kicking off with law number 9. So law number 9 covers, now once the game has started, how do you prepare and maintain the playing area? So the playing area consists of the whole of the outfield, including the square, and the square contains the uh, mat pits. So how do you prepare and maintain this area once the game has started? Mowing. So the law tells us that the pits and the outfield needs to be mowed. And when we speak about mowing, uh, we now um, the, and the law refers to uh, more day cricket, uh, for example, test match cricket, where there are more than one uh, innings uh, in the match. So test match cricket, for example, the, uh, it it spans over uh, five days. So the law tells us that because the match spans over five days, the pitch and the outfield needs to be mowed. Why do the pitch and the outfield needs to be mowed? Uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, I've been um, fourth, um, uh, third umpire for, for many of first class games. You'll be surprised how quickly the grass grows, especially overnight and especially on the pitch. Um, the law tells us that the pitch needs to be covered uh, overnight. While it's covered overnight, you'll be surprised how quickly the grass grow. So the law wants us to, to mow the pitch and the outfield. And the reason for this is the law wants to try to keep the condition of the pitch and the outfield uh, the same over the five days. Uh, yes, the, the pits uh, do deteriorate over the five days, but uh, the law wants us just to try to make sure that the pitch and the outfield stay the same over the five days. I'm using the test match as an example. So law tell us when it comes to the pitch and the outfield, they need to be mowed on each subsequent day. So before the game, let's use the test match as an example. Day, um, day one, so before the match starts, the, the ground authority, they will prepare the, the pits and the outfield. So now once the game has started, the law wants both the pits and the outfield to be mown on 
each subsequent day. So day day two, the the law wants the pitch outfield to be mowed. Similarly for day three and day four and day five. And just the reason for this is we're going to try to keep uh, the conditions exactly the same over the five day span of the test mats. So the timing of this mowing, so now we know the pitch and the outfield needs to be mowed on each subsequent day, on day two, three, four, and five. So when do we mow the pitch and the outfield? Firstly, when it comes to mowing of the pitch, the law tells us that the, the, the pitch needs to be, the mowing of the pitch needs to be completed 30 minutes before play is about to start and before any sweeping and prior to rolling. If I use an example, let's say our test match starts at 10 o'clock. All the law tell us when it comes to the mowing of the pits, by half past nine, the mowing of the pits needs to be completed. So you can mow 9.15, 9.20, 9.22, 9.25, as long as that mowing is completed before 9.30, if our game starts at 10 o'clock. So um, in, a, in, in a test match, so what will happen? The, uh, the fourth umpire needs to supervise uh, the, the mowing of, of the pitch. So if the game starts at 10 o'clock, usually by between 9.15 and, and 9.20, the fourth umpire needs to be downstairs um, on the field and needs to supervise the mowing of the pits. When it comes to the mowing of the outfield, here the law tells us that it needs to be completed 15 minutes before play is about to start. So if the game starts at 10 o'clock, or, um, the day's play starts at 10 o'clock. By 9.45, the mowing of the outfield needs to be completed. So are we allowed to clear the debris from the pits? What, what, are, what are debris? This debris is uh, the small stones or small pebbles that that uh, comes loose from the the surface um, of of the pits yeah, because batters are running um, on the pits the bowlers are bowling following through these small stones and pebbles they do become loose and get sprayed over over the pits the law allows for these small stones or small pebbles or the or the debris as the law calls it to be removed from the pits. So now we know we can remove these small stones or small debris. When can we do it? Firstly, before the start of each day's play, after you've done the mowing, but it needs to be done before rolling and not earlier than 30 minutes, nor later than 10 minutes before play is about to start. So before start of each day's play, pits needs to be cleared, uh, um, the debris needs to be cleared from the pits. We'll see later in the slide how we clear the debris from the pits. Secondly, pits needs to be cleared from the debris between innings, and this needs to happen before rolling is to take place. So let's say side A gets bowled out. We'll see in later slides that you, you'll now be allowed to, to roll between, uh, between the innings. So the, the, the uh, new batting side is allowed um, rolling. So before that rolling takes place, the law allows that debris can be cleared from the pits. So you need to clear this debris before the rolling takes place. Also, at all intervals for meals, so in the test match, there's a, there is a um, lunch interval and there's a tea interval. So during these intervals, 
the law allow that the ground staff may clear debris from the pits. So now we know when debris can be cleared. So how do we clear debris from the pits? The law tell us that it needs to be done by sweeping. So you need to use a broom to clear the debris from the pits. So the ground staff, they will have a, a, a broom. And as part of your duties as, uh, as the, the fourth umpire, let's say the fourth umpire in, in, in a test match, so you will also supervise the clearance of, of debris from the, from the pits. And you also need to make sure that exactly the same broom is used on, on all day. So if day one, if they use a specific broom, you need to make sure that that same broom is used on day two, three, four, and five. So clearance of debris done by sweeping. There's an exception. The other exception is if the umpires think that by using the broom, this may be detrimental to uh, the pits. If that is the case, the debris can be cleared by the use of a hand. So if the umpires feel that the pits is brittle, for example, you'll find in different countries, the, the, the surfaces are so much uh, different. You'll find in South Africa and Australia, pitches, uh, it's just a different type of soil they use in South Africa and Australia. So pitches are, are much harder than other places of the world. Uh, for example, the subcontinent, because they, they do use a different uh, type of soil, pitches are much more uh, brittle. And sometimes if you want to clear the debris, and you are going to use a broom, it might be detrimental to, to the pits. If that is the case, you'll tell the ground staff, please do not use the broom, because if you're going to use the broom, um, you might uh, damage the pits. In that case, how do you clear the debris? The ground staff needs to clear the debris by using the hand or hands. Very important for the exam. So how do you maintain the pits? In particular, rolling of uh, the pits. So now the game has started. So before the game has, uh, before the game has started, the ground staff can roll as much as they can. Let's say day one of the test match, let's say um, Monday is day one of the test match and the test match starts at 10 o'clock. So April the 3rd, um, day one of our test match starting at 10 o'clock. On Saturday, the groundsman can roll a whole day. Let's say today, groundsman can roll a whole day. Tomorrow, roll a whole day. Monday morning, from 6 o'clock the morning, that ground, uh, the staff can roll that pitch. The game has not started yet, so they can prepare that pitch as they see fit. But once the game has started, so once the toss has taken place, the rolling of the pitch needs to be done under the supervision of the umpires, but also the law guides us here how and when the pitch needs to be rolled once the game is started. So before the game, ground staff can do whatever. They can roll as long as they want. But once the game has started, there are certain times that the pitch may be rolled, and there's also an amount of time that the pitch can be rolled. So let's have a look at what the laws say in terms of rolling of the pitch once the game has started. So firstly, now the game has started. The law tells us there's only two instances that the pitch may be rolled. What are these two instances? Uh, firstly, before the start of each subsequent day's play. So let's use our five-day test match as an, an example. On, on day two, day three, day four, and day five, before the start of that day, the law tells us that the pitch may be rolled. So that's the first instance. Once the game has started, the pitch may only be rolled 
at the start of each subsequent day's play. So now we're referring to at the start of day two, day three, day four, day five, the pitch may be rolled. That's firstly. Secondly, before the start of each innings, the pitch may be rolled. So a side gets dismissed or a side declares or side forfeits uh, uh, um, its innings. Before the start of the new innings, the pitch may be rolled. So now we know when the pitch may be rolled. Before the start of each uh, innings and before the start of each subsequent day's play. So now we know when. How long? The law guides us here but, but and say that the pitch may be rolled for not more than seven minutes. So that's all the law will tell us. Not more than seven minutes. So, you, so are you allowed to roll the pitch for five minutes? Yes, you are. Are you allowed to roll it for four minutes? Of course you are. For three minutes, yes. For 30 seconds, yes. All the law tell us not more than seven uh, minutes. So now we know once the game has started, when the pitch may be rolled. So it's either before the start of each innings and secondly, before the start of each subsequent day's play and the timing, how long may the rolling take place? Not more than seven minutes. So in practice, how does this work in, uh, in practice? Let's use our five-day test match as an example. So Monday is day one of, of the, the test match. So before uh, 10 o'clock, the match starts. Anytime before 10 o'clock, the ground staff or before the toss takes place, half past nine, the ground staff can prepare the pitch. They can roll it as long as they want. Now the game has started. Now we on day one. So big part of the fourth umpire's duties. And if I can use uh, the one example of when the pitch um, may be rolled, it's before the start of each subsequent day's play. So now we on day two. The law tell us that before the start of day two, the pitch may be rolled. We, we, late in the slide, we're going to see when the timings of this, but the law allows start of day two that the pitch may be rolled. So it's important for the fourth umpire. So the game start, the 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 um, um, day's play will start at 10 o'clock on day two. The fourth umpire will go to the batting captain at the time. The fourth umpire will then ask the batting captain at the time, do you want rolling or not? And if you do want rolling, how long you want that rolling to be? And also, there's another option for the batting captain. Usually at international and provincial grounds, you'll find that there are more than one roller available. At many international and, and provincial grounds, you'll, you'll find three rollers available. A, uh, a big roller, you'll find a, a medium-sized uh, roller, and then you'll find a small roller, which is usually a, a hand roller, so they'll, they'll push it by hand. That's the small roller. The medium is the smaller. The, um, the, uh, that's an option. And also the, the, the big roller. So part of your duty as uh, the fourth umpire in the test match, so on the morning of day two, the batting captain at the time, so who's ever batting at the, um, at the start of the day's play, the fourth umpire needs to go to that particular captain and ask the captain, Captain, do you want rolling? If yes, how long you want rolling to be? And also, which roller do you, you want to be? But usually the captain will say, nine out of ten times the captain will say, yes, I want the rolling. How long? May I please have the full seven minutes? And then you also need to ask you which roller. The back captain will tell you then, I want the big roller or the medium one or the small one, whichever the case. So that is the first instance. That, that's in practice how it happens. So the same will apply on day three, day four, and day five, where the fourth umpire needs to go to the batting captain at the time and ask those three questions. The other time when the rolling can take place is at the start of each innings, where 
when once a team is dismissed, let's say team A gets bowled out um, at two o'clock um, on the day two, what now needs to happen? The now the new uh, batting captain, you need to ask that batting captain, captain, do you want rolling? And if you do want rolling, how long you want um, ro the rolling to be? And lastly, which roller you want? So you you need to find out those uh, in uh, that information. And if the captain is say tell you, yes, Abdullah, I want rolling. I want it the full seven minutes. And please give me the big roller. You will then relay that message to the ground staff, and and they will then. Um, do the rolling and it needs to be under your supervision. It needs to be under the fourth umpire's supervision. So you need to physically stand there, just as uh, in the previous slide when, when um, the sweeping and the, the, the uh, mowing takes place, you need to physically supervise it. Similarly with the rolling, you need to stand there. Uh, you need to time it as well. The ground staff usually look at you. So you look at your watch. Um, if the captain wants seven minutes of rolling, you need to time. You need to make sure that uh, they get the seven minutes of rolling. So now in the, the timing of these rolling. Rolling permitted before play begins on any day. Not more than 30 minutes and not less than 10 minutes before play is about to start. So there's a window period that this rolling takes place before the start of each day's play. So now we on day two, we've just heard that what is what is your duty as the fourth umpire on day two? You need to go to the batting captain at the time and you need to ask, do you want rolling? Which roller and how long? So now after ascertaining that information, you relay it to the, the groundsman. So we now have that information. But now when? The game starts at 10 o'clock. When can this rolling take place? 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock? The law guides us here. The law tells us there is a window period that this rolling will take place on day 2, day 3, 4, and 5. So game starts at 10 o'clock. That window period is between 9.30 and 9.50, the game starts at 10 o'clock. So any time between 9.30 and 9.50, that is when that rolling can take place. Nine out of 10 times, uh, uh, usually captains, uh, they just tell you they want rolling. So usually at half past nine, we want to get this done. So as the fourth umpire, at exactly half past nine, you'll instruct the, the ground staff to do the rolling under your supervision. The law allows the, the batting, uh, the uh, captain to delay this rolling, but the latest is 9.50. So the captain tells you, um, I, um, I want the rolling, but I want you to do it at 9.40, no problem. I want to do it at 9.45, no issue. I want you to do it at 9.50, you're still in that window period, not later than 9.50. If the captain tells you, yeah, but I wanted to do it, you to do it at 9.55, no, you won't allow it because the window period for this rolling is 9.30, uh, between 9.30 and 9.50 if the game starts at 10 o'clock. Are you allowed to water the pitch once the game has started? So before the game has started, the ground staff, while preparing the pitch, they can do whatever they can. Roll is to their arch content. They can alter. They are preparing the pitch for the for our test match. So before the game started, they can do whatever they want. But once the game has started, in our five-day test match, are you allowed to alter the pitch? No, you're not allowed to alter. The ground staff is not allowed to alter the pitch. Are you allowed to remark the creases? Yes, you are allowed to remark the creases, and, and these uh, the uh, remarking usually happens during the the intervals. So what happens during, uh, let's say, you call lunch, the ground staff will come onto the field. The fourth umpire now also in our test match needs to go onto the field. We've just saw that during lunchtime and tea time. What will happen? 
the pits uh, may be cleared of debris, so the ground ground staff will clear the pits of debris, and the fourth umpire needs to supervise this. And what the ground staff will also do is they will remark uh, the creases, especially the popping crease, a uh, bowler's landing continuously on the popping crease. Sometimes that uh, the white line do disappear. The ground staff will just remark the creases. Uh, the, they usually do all the creases. Uh, but but especially the uh, the popping crease and again the fourth umpire in the test match needs to supervise this. Are you allowed to maintain the footholds? The law allows for this because what happens? Bowlers landing on the same spot, um, ball of the ball over of of the of the over. So sometimes it uh, a bit old uh, the uh, old. Um, develops where the bowler keeps on uh, landing and the law allows that at the end of the day that these uh, holes be uh, re -turf. so you're allowed to re um the foot holes. Also in terms of securing the foot, foot holes, the law allows that the foot holes can be secured uh, during the game. Uh, sometimes bowlers landing, landing becomes a hole um, bowlers needs to be secure of the foothold. Bowler will sometimes ask you, umpire, can you just get the groundsman uh, on the, um, and ask the groundsman with the hammer just to flatten the area where I land. You will, you will allow that. You'll ask the groundsman to come onto the field with the hammer, flatten the, the landing area. You will allow that. Last law that I am covering for today before we go into our Q&A uh, session is intervals, and there's only one slide here, so that tells you there is an exam question on this slide. So what is classified as an interval according to the laws of a cricket. And again, in our in, in this exam, in the level two exam, it's not as the level one exam, as Tom explained, level one, there was, you know, multiple choice questions, fill in the missing words. In the level two exam, it's a written exam, there's much more uh, um, writing to do. So what the things that you do need to look at is the uh, points al allocation uh, next to the question, you'll see the questions and in bracket, you'll see the points allocation. You need to make sure that if it's a four point or five point uh, mark for that particular question, that you do dot down five uh, points for that particular uh, answer. So an interval, the following shall be classified as a scheduled interval as per the laws of cricket. So what are those? Firstly, the period between close of play on day one and the start of the next day's play. That is classified as a scheduled interval. Okay, the in our test match, let's say play starts at ten o'clock on day one and ends at five o'clock on that uh, on the same day, and the next day play will start at ten o'clock again. So law tell us that on day one. When the game, uh, um, when the day's play ended at 1700 hours, and the following morning, the game will on day two will start at 10 o'clock. So between 1700 hours, which was a uh, close of play on day one, and the start of play on day two at 10 o'clock, that is a scheduled interval as per the laws of cricket. The 10 minute interval between innings is also a scheduled interval. Your interval for lunch and tea, also classified as per the law as a scheduled interval. Interval for drinks, scheduled interval. And lastly, any other agreed interval. So these are the five instances or, or five classifications as per the laws of cricket of scheduled intervals. So these are all the laws that I am covering for today. We're now going to go into revision questions for these uh, laws that we've covered. It is going to be an interactive uh, session. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on the the um, the question. We're going to open the floor and Tom will facilitate this process. We will then ask um, the floor or anyone to answer. Um, if it's a four, if it's a four point, if it's a four point um, uh, answer, if um, if you can um, give letter one um, answer per attendee, we'll keep it interactive and try to get as many uh, uh, people uh, um, interacting while we do the revision questions. So the first revision question: When is the ball to have made contact with? the bat and you'll see in brackets it's a four uh, uh it's a four point answers you need so four points you'll get for this particular question so you need to give at least four points in your answer so tom do we have any hands raised uh, abdullah we don't have any hands raised uh, until now uh, jp van yatsholt with the first hand up for the course. Uh, JP, please unmute your microphone and give us uh, one of the four reasons or um, examples when the ball is to have made contact with the bat. JP? Uh, hi, guys. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead. Uh, it's with the bat itself. With the bat itself is correct. Thank you. Next hand up is Angela Sando. Hi, can you hear me, Tom? Loud and clear, Angela. Go ahead. If the ball makes contact with the batsman's glove. With the batsman's glove, there is a disclaimer to that. What the the the, the glove needs to be holding something. The, the the glove needs to be holding the the bat. That's correct. Yes. So if the ball makes contact with a glove holding the bat, then it Correct. has considered to made contact with the bat. Well done. Next hand up, Aniki. Aniki, unmute. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, contact with materials like the grip of the bat. Uh, contact with materials yeah. of the bat. That's correct, Aniki. Very well done. And the next hand up to answer the last part of this question, Linda Koza. Please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. When a ball touches the handle of the bat. Uh, when the ball touches the handle of the bat, uh, I think that is considered as as the bat. Um, so we've probably covered that, uh, Linda. I see Swati, you've also got your hand up. Uh, if you can unmute your microphone, please, and try give us the last part of this answer. Swati, unmute your microphone, please. Yeah, it looks like Swati is no longer with us. Uh, we've got a 3605 guest. Please unmute your microphone and uh, take us through that last part. I have all given you the um, facility to unmute your microphone, so please unmute your microphone when requested. 3605 guest. OK, I see Chappie has got his microphone unmuted. Chappie, do you want to give us a answer? Morning, Tom. Sorry, I'm a bit. I'm not that savvy with this text. I'm going to try and do it. Uh, isn't it when it's something legal is attached to the bat, like the, 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 the grip or something like the bat, that something legal that's attached to the bat? <laughs> Yeah, Abdullah, if you can take us through the exact wording of that final part of the answer, uh, Chappie, that's uh, that that's a good vocal answer or verbal answer. Uh, let, let's see what the right way to write it down would be. Thank you. So, Tom, are you able to see the point bullet point number four where they speak about any additional material permitted? Uh, 
Correct, yes. Yeah, so those uh, examples of those is, as Chappy uh, said, is uh, the grip. Uh, another example is some batsmen do put toe guards uh, at the bottom of the bat. That is also allowed as per the law. So also, if the ball makes contact with the toe guard and ball, ball gets uh, taken cleanly um, by the fielding side, batsmen can be given out court. Yeah, so these are the four instances when the ball have made contact with the bat. Next revision question. So now if you can uh, visualize this. So for me, um, uh, uh, what helps me uh, answer this question if, uh, if, we are, if you can visualize uh, what they're asking you. So just visualize the question. So upon arriving at the field, so now this is, let's use a test match as an example. So let's say Monday, the 3rd of April, our test match uh, started, or is will start. So the, um, um, the match will start at 10 o'clock on Monday, day one. So you get to the field at 8 o'clock. So upon arriving at the field at 8 o'clock on day one of your test match starting at 10 o'clock, you and your colleague, you notice that the ground staff or the curator is still rolling the pits. What will you do? Abdullah, we've got a hand up from the previous question. Colette, do you want to answer this question? Uh, sorry. Um, yes. <laughs> um, if the if you arrive at eight and the game starts at ten, they are allowed to roll until thirty minutes before the start of play. Am I um, am I correct? <laughs> Abdullah will tell you if you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Colette, you're 100% correct. You will take no action. Uh, it's day one. The game hasn't started yet. So the ground staff, they are allowed to prepare that pitch. The game usually starts uh, at the toss. So uh, um, toss usually is at uh, 9.30. If our game starts at 10, uh, 10 o'clock. So before that toss takes place, and in our case, or my example I used, it, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, day one. They're rolling the pitch you will take no action because the law tell us that before the match and up to the toss the ground authority they are responsible for preparing that pitch so they can roll to their heart's content so well done colette so, and just lastly uh, so once the match has started now there are certain laws that kicks in when it comes to rolling um, of the pitch. But before the game, you will not get involved. Next question. So now the game has started. And the law tell us that once at uh, the um, the game has now started. It now becomes the um, uh, the maintenance and the preparation of the ground and the square and the pitch becomes the responsibility of the umpires. So in terms of the maximum time allowed for rolling, what is that time? How long, once the game has started, how long are you allowed to roll? the pitch. Ah, how many minutes are you allowed to roll the pitch? 60 minutes, 50, 40? Do we have any hands, Tom? Abdullah, we've got about half of the class with hands up because this is a very easy question. Okay. Uh, first person was actually from the previous question. Uh, Laksh, do you want to unmute your microphone and answer this question, please? Um, but not more than seven minutes. Not more than seven minutes, 100%. 100%. Again, a maximum of seven minutes. If you if you ask the question to the captain, do you want the rolling? And you ask him how many minutes, and the captain tells you, I want five minutes or four minutes, you, you will allow that. You, don't, you won't tell the captain, no, but the law said it must be seven minutes. No, it's up to a max of seven minutes. If the captain tells you, may I please have rolling for 10 minutes? 
Now I will say, sorry, Captain, the law only allows a max of seven, so I'll give you that maximum, seven minutes. Well done. Next question. So in terms of the timings, when is the earliest and the latest time for a pitch to be rolled on any day of a match? So in our test match, on day two, day three, day four, day five, we've learned that the pitch may be rolled um, at um, when a side get, um, start of an innings, or so side gets his missed or declares or forfeits at the start of the innings, the pitch may be rolled, and we've learned that the pitch may be rolled at the start of day two, day three, day four, day five. Now, in terms of the timings on day two, uh, day two starts, day's play starts at 10 o'clock. What does the law say? What is the earliest and when is the latest for that pitch to be rolled? And in our example, let's say day two. Same principle will apply for three, day three, four, and five, but let's say they use day two as an example. What's the earliest and what is the latest if our days of play, day of play starts or at 10 o'clock? Abdullah, once again, lots of hands up. Uh, good to see Western Province Cricket Umpires Association member Lucinda with her hand up. Lucinda, please unmute your microphone and help us through this answer. Good morning, Tom. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead. Thank you. First of all, you have to um, ask the batting captain if they... Um, and then anything between 9.30 and 9.50 latest will be 9.50. That will be the start of the game if it starts at 10 o'clock. That's the date. <laughs> Perfect. Well done, Lucinda. Well um, taught. <laughs> yeah, well, well done, by, Lucinda. By the head of training. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so just uh, as per the law, laws of cricket, so also been answering these questions um, when the um, Oh, moderator, whoever's going to mark your question paper, they won't be looking for you to quote the law verbatim. As long as they, when they look at your answer, uh, they want to see whether there is understanding, whether you are covering or you, um, um, you know, the law. So point I'm trying to make is no need to quote verbatim. You can just make sure that when in explaining your answer, you just explain exactly how the law works. So um, the uh, the um, answer as per the memo tell us that, so yes, the rolling will be permitted and we know it's a maximum of seven minutes and it's before play begins and not more than 30 minutes before the uh, scheduled time. Captain May delay the start of such rolling until not less than 10 minutes. So that is just the, the memo answer, but Lucinda answered it uh, perfectly. Again, do not need to quote the law verbatim as long as in your explanation, you just explain to us or whoever's marking, or whoever's marking your, uh, your question paper just need to know um, in your own words, you can put it in your own words, um, how the law works and um, yeah, and they'll be happy with that answer. Next one. At what time should the mowing of the pitch on any day be completed? So we uh, we now know we, we know that the pitch needs to be mowed on each subsequent day's place. So on day two, day three, day four, and day five, the pitch needs to be mowed. So on let's use this. Uh, Day two is an example. So on day two, with our play starting at 10 o'clock, what time should the mowing of the pitch be completed? Quite a few hands up again, Abdullah. Uh, top of the list is Lia Bona. Please unmute your microphone, Lia Bona, and give us your answer to this question. Okay, mowing may not take place earlier than 30 minutes before start to play. OK, so if we've got a 10 a.m. start, when does mowing need to be completed, Leah Bonner? 
should should be completed by half past nine. Perfect. Uh, perfect, Leah uh, Bona. So all the law tell us that before half past nine, the mowing of the pitch needs to be complete completed. So whether it happens at nine fifteen. 9.20, 9.25, as long as it's completed by 9.30. So so in, in, in practice, with, uh, in many of the provincial games I, I did, we'll usually instruct the groundsman between 9.15 and 9.20 um, to do the mowing. So that's usually when it happens. But again, it's uh, before um, half an hour before play starts, before 9.30. So 9.15 is fine, 9.20 is fine. So well done, Nebona. Last of the revision questions for today. Name four interval breaks that are classified as per the laws as scheduled intervals or scheduled intervals. Name four of them. There's five in this in this one. They only want you to name four. Any hands, Tom? Yes, Stula, we've got plenty of hands. Uh, some of them are repeated, so I'm going to pick people who have not yet answered. Uh, Oswald, please unmute your microphone and uh, give us one example of a scheduled interval, please. Good morning. Morning. Um, drinks break. Correct. An interval for drinks is one of them. Um, next hand up that hasn't previously answered a question, Nirav, please unmute your microphone and give us an example of a scheduled interval. Hi, am I audible? Loud and clear, Nirav, go ahead. Uh, meals. Intervals for meals, quite correct. Thank you for that. Next hand up that hasn't previously answered is Adil Kassam. Adil, please unmute your microphone and give us an example. Morning, everyone. Interval between the innings. Interval between innings is a scheduled interval. Thank you very much. Next hand up that hasn't previously answered a question is Mo Matha. Mo, if you can please unmute your microphone and give us another example of a scheduled interval. I think we've got two more left that haven't been mentioned. <coughs> Mo, are you still with us? Doesn't seem like uh, Mo is with us. Uh, Johan V, you've got your hand up next. Please unmute your microphone and give us another example of a scheduled interval. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Johan. Go ahead. Uh, the period between close of play on one day and the next day's play. 100%. Mm -hmm. Now I am looking for one last example of a scheduled interval. And yes is a hand up that we haven't heard from yet this morning. Yash, please unmute your microphone and give us the last example. Uh, it's interval for drinks and any other agreed interval? Any other agreed interval was the last one I was looking for. And yeah. there Abdullah is putting all five of them up. Now what you will notice in the revision questions that we put up, in brackets after every question is the number of marks that they are for in the exam. So for this particular question, it was out of four marks. There are five possible correct answers, um, but the maximum you will get in the exam for this question is four. So always make sure that you look at the number of marks allocated to a question. Uh, for you to give enough information for the answer. Right, and on that, I think there was a question in the chat box, which I will go through now. The question was, how many marks is the exam out of and what is the pass mark for the exam? 
So the pass mark for the exam is uh, 80 out of 100. So a minimum of 80% is required to uh, pass the exam and it is out of 100. Um, the exam is scheduled for two hours. Um, we do allow a little bit more time um, if you need more time than the two hours. Uh, but please, guys, uh, as with any exam, you should be finishing in time. It's not a particularly difficult exam and shouldn't take uh, a lot longer than two hours. Uh, we will be lenient, especially on the online uh, or remote writing examiners, uh, exam candidates, um, but within reason. I think after two and a half hours, um, we will have to stop you there. Right, so let's go through the questions in the chat box. And once we've gone through those questions, if there are any further questions, then we will take questions uh, live on the floor. So, Johan B asks, if a sticker during your batting innings on the edge comes loose on the edge of the bat comes loose and the ball touches the sticker and it is a fair catch taken by the wicket keeper i'm assuming it'll be given out considering it is part of the bat you want to take that one for us abdullah uh, um yes tom uh, thanks for your question Johan. Johan, yes you will be given out a uh, sticker seen as part of the additional material that is allowed um per the laws of cricket so if a sticker do come becomes loose and the ball um, uh, touches it and gets taken by the keeper, yes, the batter um, on appeal will will be given out. Um, you'll uh, it it happens quite often, uh, Johan, that stickers do become loo um, loose. You'll then find um, the batter coming to you as, as the umpire. So uh, um, part of uh, the equipment that you need to to have on you um, as an umpire is. A, a small uh, a small scissor or small something to cut with the batter if the um, sticker stickers becomes loose on the bat they will come to you and ask for your scissor and ask you to cut off the um, the piece of loose um, sticker so it happens quite often uh, they'll come to you because they know if the ball makes contact with it they they can be uh, given out so yes over to you tom thanks Tula. next question is from nira what happens when the ball touches the glove of the batter and is caught by a fielder while that particular hand is not holding the bat? Will he be given out or not? Maybe I can just illustrate that. I've got a bat next to me, Abdullah. Hold on. So if my bottom hand is off the bat and the ball hits that glove with the the hand off the bat and goes through to the wicket keeper um it's a clean catch but will that be given out caught uh, niraf the law guides us here the law tell us that for the ball to have made contact the hand your hand needs to hold the bat it needs to be holding the bat so for if the ball touches the hand that is or the glove that is holding the bat and the cat is fairly taken yes the batter should be given out caught so the important part here is the hand needs to be holding the bat and if the ball goes against it then the batter can be given out so what happens or how does the law see it if the hand is not holding the bat, so now the hand is off the bat, and now the ball makes contact with the hand that's off the bat, and let's say it ricochets, goes against the glove uh, that's off the bat, and it ricochets to first slip. How does the law see this? The law see this hand that is now off the bat as part of your person. It does not see it as, as part of the bat anymore. It sees as it see it as part of your person. So what happens if the ball uh, uh, goes against part of your person and it uh, ricochets to first slip? Let's use this another example. Um, let's say the ball goes against your shoulder and it goes to first slip and it gets caught. Will you give the batter out? No, you won't. 
I cannot give the bat out. If it is part of your person and it gets caught, not out. So in this case, because the law says with the hand not holding the bat or the hand that is off the bat or not holding the handle, the law now sees that hand as part of the person. So if if the ball goes against the hand that's off the bat or not holding the bat and it ricochets to, to first slip, you will not give the batter out because that hand that's not on the handle is seen as part of the batter's person. Over, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Tula. I am uh, now sharing my screen to help answer the next question. The next question is from Nazim, and he wants to know about the arm guard. Uh, does the arm guard still count as part of the bat in an instant of a catch? Uh, the simple answer, uh, Nazim, is no. The arm guard is not part of the hand, is not part of the bat, and needs to, as far as possible, be away from the glove and the strap of the glove. OK, um, I'm busy sharing a picture of Liam Livingston. He was um, injured while bowling or fielding. Oh, I think he was injured while batting in the first innings of a first class game. And when he came out to bat in the second innings of that game, he wore his arm guard over his glove and that was to protect his hand that was damaged in the first innings. And a lot of people were asking the question as to if the ball now comes off the arm guard that is in contact with the glove, which is holding the bat, is that considered part of the bat? And the answer is no. Uh, arm guard is an arm guard. And even though it is Touching the glove it is not considered as part of the glove and it is not considered as holding the bat. Um, in this situation, what the umpires should have done is not allowed uh, Liam Livingston to cover the glove with the arm guard. They should have told him uh, either to remove the arm guard or to wear it uh, as it's normally worn. Uh, on the forearm and not over the hand. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Nazim. Next question is from Lucinda. Who is responsible for the ground if there is no groundsman or grounds lady? Abdullah, you want to take us through that? Uh, yes, sir. And that thanks. And that, happen, that happens quite often in club cricket. So I think it's a very valid question for all our uh, club umpires. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Lucinda. Um, so um, in my in many of the examples I use uh, the, this evening, uh, you know, we covered uh, international cricket or, or provincial cricket where uh, at these stadiums there are ground staff available. But if you go a bit lower down, especially to, um, to a club level, Yes, there are many times where there are, uh, I can count on my maybe two, three fingers in, 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 in Cape Town, South Africa, um, at a club ground where there are ground staff available. I think there's only two clubs or maybe three clubs in the whole of Cape Town, South Africa, where there are, are ground staff um, available. So you would find that, let's say 99%, you will not find ground staff available. The... Um, how does these pitches uh, get prepared? So in Cape Town, uh, you'll find the the various grounds or many of the grounds belonging to the municipality uh, um, of Cape Town. So they uh, will um, contract contractors to um, to prepare these um, the various grounds for club cricket on any given um, um, weekend. So usually these contractors will come either Thursday or Friday. They will go to the, the various grounds and they will then prepare the, uh, the match pitch for play on Saturday. So this happens Thursday or a Friday. 
So now Saturday, you get the pitches already prepared, lines are uh, drawn. This, most of the grounds will not have a ground or ground staff available. So now what do you do and who's, the, who's the responsible? So the home club, they need to take responsibility in terms of, um, so the pitch gets prepared by these con contractors, but in terms of laying out the, 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 the boundaries, putting the stumps in the home side, that is uh, their responsibility. And um, so part of your duties as an umpire is, is you know, checking that the, uh, um, or measuring the pitch, making sure that the measurements are, are correct. And sometimes it, it is very difficult. If you do get to a ground, measurements are not as per, as per the laws. Uh, finding a groundsman, let's say it, it is 20 centimeters too short or 10 centimeters too, uh, too long, finding a groundsman to redo the lines, it's, it is virtually uh, impossible. Uh, so it is it is a challenge at mo at at most of the 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 cl club grounds because there's no ground staff available. Uh, but it's the responsibility of the home side to to get the field ready the best of their ability. If it's not not possible, let's say so they don't have the equipment, let's say to to um, uh, to remark uh, the uh, the lines. In those instances, if it's just a few centimeters too long or, uh, um, or too short, we'll mention it to the captains, but we'll allow play um, to, um, to continue. Uh, if it is possible, let's say they can find paint and redo the lines, uh, by all means, you'll allow them to do it. But if not, yeah, it is difficult. But to answer your question, Lucinda, the home side, it's their responsibility to try to get the the field and the pitch uh, uh, um, playable. Abdullah. Uh, yes, Lucinda. Um, can it be anybody, um, a supporter of that club, or must it be an official person from that specific club? So the um, yeah, it, it can be anybody that get a, so usually the people that attends the the uh, or comes to the games, they are members of of the club. So it can be anyone. Doesn't have to be the chairperson of the club. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, uh, you know, one on exco. Um, usually they are members of the club. I don't think uh, there'll be spectators at at these fields that does not belong to, um, to to the club. So yeah, you'll allow uh, any of them to to get the field uh, playable. Can somebody from the opposing team volunteer to help? Yeah, and that happens quite, uh, quite often where you do find both teams working together. They do want to get a, a game of cricket. You know, uh, they play on a Saturday. Uh, it's, it's their time away, away from home. They're excited. They want to play the game. And both sides then work together to get the play, the, the field playable. So, yes, you, you'll allow if they prepare to help, but it's the responsibility of the home side. It's their home ground. It's their responsibility to get the field playable as, as far as possible. But if the opposing side is willing to, to get their hands uh, dirty, by all means, you, you'll allow that. Great stuff. Thanks for the questions, Lucinda, and the answers, Abdullah. Uh, next question in the chat box is from Oswood. Can rolling happen after the toss? Uh, no, Oswood. The, remember that the field belongs to the ground authority before uh, the match starts, and the match is um, technically um, handed over to the umpires at the toss. So from the moment that the field is handed over to the umpires at the toss, uh, no further rolling can take place until we have a change of innings or the next day uh, before the day's play starts. Uh, then we can have rolling between 9.30 and 9.50 if we have a 10 a.m. start for day two, three, four and five in a test match. Next question. Uh, uh, Tom, yes. uh, Tom, if I can just add something, add something to that. Hmm. Uh, so, um, uh, so Oswald, 
there is a, a a possibility that the pitch can be rolled after after the toss. There is a small allowance in the law for this to happen. Doesn't happen that often in my uh, 15 years of umpiring and in my 10 years of being of doing provincial and franchise cricket uh, for cricket uh, South Africa. This has never happened to me, uh, but because it's part of the law, uh, it must have happened. Um, um, uh, many times. So the law actually allows after the toss for rolling to take to take place. And only in this one instance where the law allows it. So now we're on day one of our test mats. Game starts, play starts at 10 o'clock. 9.30 the toss took place. Side, uh, side A, captain of side A wins the toss, decides we're going to have a bat. Toss is done, 9.30. At 9.32, it starts raining. Now, they remember, the toss, took, the, uh, the toss has taken place, so the, now, the ground now belongs to the umpires. You now call the ground staff, bring on the covers. So we day one of our test mats, 9.30, the toss uh, uh, took place on day one, and, um, and 9.32, it starts raining. Pits are now covered. So only in this one instance, when there is a delay in play after the toss has taken on day one, only this one instance, and there must be a, 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 a delay. And also if the umpires feel that because of uh, this de de delay, um, like in our case, the pitch was now covered, in this instance, you will allow the batting captain rolling. Only in this one's instance. Rain delay, pits are now covered. Toss has taken place day one. That is the only time. But again, I'm not sure if it happened to you, Tom, but in all my years of umpiring, this has never happened to me. We just after the toss, there is a, uh, a, an interruption. But just to answer your question, uh, yes, Oswald can happen. It hasn't happened to me, but the law allows uh, for this. Over, Tom. Uh, thanks for that, Abdullah. Uh, it is indeed in the law. I had uh, forgotten about that. Just a question. If it is allowed, um, is it for a limit of up to seven minutes or is it as long as it takes for the field to get ready uh, for um, play? This is only for max of seven minutes. So you'll allow the batting captain to... Um, to get the rolling. The game has now started. So that yeah. that's where the seven right. minutes kicks right. in. So now it's max seven minutes. Makes sense. Thanks. Thanks very much okay. for clearing that up. Great stuff. Uh, next question is from Norbert in Uganda. Uh, what can be considered as an agreed interval? Uh, any example? Uh, yes, Norbert, uh, we do have an example that we quite often use uh, in our level one course when we go through this law. Uh, many years ago, there was an Ashes test match at Lords between Australia and uh, England. And the Queen of England uh, at the time wanted to uh, visit the players and meet them on the ground so she could only attend at a specific time uh, let's say that was uh, 12.30. And if you know the times for a test match in England, uh, the morning session is from 11 a.m. until 1300, 1 p.m. So usually at 12.30, there would be ongoing play. And so when she arrived and wanted to meet with the players, they had to have a agreed interval of 15 minutes from 12.30 to 12.45 uh, where the match was stopped. The players didn't go off the field. The players stayed on the field and they lined up and the Queen came out to greet them, shake their hands, and then she was off to enjoy the rest of the game from the stands or uh, went on to her next uh, duty. Uh, so that was an agreed interval outside of the, the normal intervals and uh, play was
probably extended for those 15 minutes. So lunch instead of being at 1300 would have been at 1315 only for that particular day. And this would have been agreed before the match started. Um, as to that agreed interval on day one, I think it was. Uh, so there's an example of an agreed interval. Uh, in IPL cricket, we have the strategic timeouts. Uh, those are agreed intervals which are written into the playing conditions of uh, that specific tournament. Um, so all agreed intervals usually are written into the playing conditions of a tournament, or if uh, there are no written playing conditions, uh, they will be discussed at the toss. Okay. Next question is from Blessing. If the hand is off the bat, can you be given out leg before wicket if the ball hits the glove that is no longer holding the bat and that batter is in line with the stumps. Abdullah, LBW appeal for you to adjudicate, please. So, so uh, please, um, who asked the question, Tom? Blessing. blessing. Uh, so, blessing. When the hand is off the bat, that end is now seen as part of the batter's or the striker's person. And the, uh, under the LBW law, which we will cover in, uh, in detail in a few weeks' time, for, uh, for one of the points in, uh, under LBW, for you, for you to consider an LBW, it needs to strike any part of the striker's person. Although it is, it says LBW, leg before wicket, but the law covers or says that if it strikes any part of the striker's person, so whether it's um, uh, leg, um, arm, shoulder, head, uh, any part, you can consider an LBW decision. So in your question, because the hand is off the bat and the ball strikes that end that is now off the bat. And because that end being off the bat is seen as part of the striker's person. And because it's part of the striker's person, the LBW law tell us if it's, it can strike any part of the person and then you can consider the LBW appeal. So in this case, because it's now part of the, the, the striker's person, you can consider the LBW because the hand is off the bat and the ball hit that hand that is off the bat. Over, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Um, Colette, I'll answer the question about uh, an example of an agreed interval. Uh, next question is from Laksh. Uh, what if we do not pass? So Laksh, if you um, attempt the exam and we will, depending on the number of candidates who write, if it's, say, 20 candidates who write, we will be done marking those exams in about a week. If it's 50 candidates who write, we will probably take about two, maybe three weeks. If it's 100 candidates, we might take up to a month to mark all of those papers. Um, you will get your results within that uh, period of time. Uh, if you get between um, 75 and 80 percent, uh, sorry, 75 and 79 percent. Uh, what I will do is I will uh, find your script and uh, check which question you struggled with. And then if you can uh, repeat that question, the answers of on email uh, and get it 100 percent correct, then uh, we will grant you a pass. Uh, if you get between 65 and 75%, uh, uh, then we will allow you a rewrite when level three is being written in July or August. Uh, level three dates will be confirmed uh, when we have ascertained how many people are going to write level two. So middle of May, 
uh, when all the payments are in for level two, then we will release the uh, lecture timetable as well as the exam timetable for level three. So if you get between 65% and 74% for uh, your level two exam in May, then you will be granted a free rewrite um, either July or August when level three exams are being written. Okay. Um, next question is from Swati. Can I get the correct answers to the wrong ones? Answered in uh, it, answers were actually displayed uh, once you passed. They were on the screen, or at least uh, the computer told you which ones you got correct and which ones you got incorrect. Um, but we have noted over the years that there are about three questions that are answered incorrectly by the memorandum of the level one exam. So uh, it is a bit confusing and, and, and a little bit unfair uh, that you probably got an answer right, but it was marked wrong. Um, so the short answer, I'm afraid Swati is uh, no. Uh, what you can do is you can listen very closely to level two and also level three, and I'm sure you'll be able to then work out from the new information that you are learning uh, in these courses as to what you might have got wrong in level one. Next question is from Aniki. Uh, what if the rolling of the pitch and the roller is in the middle of the pitch after the end of seven minutes? What happens then? Abdullah, in the middle of the pitch. Yeah, so Aniki, so how this works is uh, I'll use a practical uh, example. So in uh, five of the test mats, so the fourth umpire needs to supervise the rolling of the pitch. And the supervisor, the, the fourth umpire will then time it. So super, the fourth umpire will tell the, the, the curator when to start. So Anne will then give the curator regular updates, meaning let's say after three minutes, you'll say three minutes done. Five minutes, you'll say five minutes. So now, or you can say two minutes left, one minute left. So you now queuing the curator how much time there's left. So usually when there's this one minute left, you will then judge. Okay, that one minute it will take the the uh, curator uh, one more roll up or one more down. So you'll then tell the curator there's one minute left, so one more up. Or you um, let's just go one more up and then you can go off the pitch. So in practice, that is that is how uh, we do it. Um, yeah, so so you so usually uh, we get it to exactly uh, seven minutes, but ah, you know, give and take a second or two. So um, I mean, if you do say to the curator, okay, there's you know one minute left, and the ta and the and the um, roller goes slowly, and it only gets to the end of the pitch after seven minutes and two seconds or three seconds. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I mean. And no real uh, big deal, uh, but yeah. So in practice, that's how, how we do it, and usually they get it within the the seven minutes. So you yeah you cue the curator throughout the seven minutes, and that's how you get it very close to seven minutes. Over Tom. Thanks, Dula. Anaki's got another question. Uh, when clearing the debris, uh, can a blower be used in? I'm not sure if uh, law specifies on that. Any views from your side, Abdullah? Uh, yes, the law actually specifies that the only uh, instrument, if I can use it, or thing that you can use um, to clear the debris is by sweeping. The law specific here, only by sweeping. And how do you sweep? It's either two ways, either a broom or sweeping by by hand if it's detrimental to the pitch. So the law is specific only by sweeping, and the only thing that is allowed as per the law is a broom. But I have seen um, Anaki in playing conditions in uh, in a few competitions that they actually are now allowing blowers as well. 
So they do specify in the playing conditions that the um, we will allow blowers to clear the debris. But as per the laws of cricket, you only allow to use a broom to sweep to clear the debris or a or your hand to clear the debris from the pits. Over Tom. Thanks, Stella. Next question is from Oswald. What if the ball touches the arm that is covered with a cloth that is touching the gloves? Is the better out caught? Uh, Oswald, uh, similar to the picture I showed you with um, Liam Livingston covering his glove with an arm guard, the answer is no. If the ball hits a cloth that is covering the glove, um, the batter will be not out. Uh, just get the batter to remove that cloth or the arm guard so that it does not cover the glove. OK, so the glove should always be 100 percent exposed, um, especially with an arm guard. Uh, it shouldn't cover the strap of the glove. OK, the arm guard should be uh, there should be a, a little bit of a gap between the strap of the glove and the start of the arm guard so that you as an umpire are able to make that decision uh, clearly. Uh, Laksh asks if are we sharing the slides we have just presented via email. Uh, Laksh, uh, last week Saturday on the 25th of March, I sent out the course material, which includes the entire presentation that we will be using for the five weeks. And then on the sixth Saturday, we will be going through all of these revision questions again. Um, and after that sixth lecture, then I will send all of you by email a combined uh, slide deck of all the questions uh, that we have covered in our revision section. Uh, note that we will not be sending you on email the answers to the questions, OK? Because a lot of these revision questions are repeated in the exam, we cannot be sending you uh, documented answers uh, from the exam. So um, you will only get the questions for you to review those answers. You will need to watch the recordings of the lectures uh, that have given you the answers to the revision questions. Uh, next question is from Aniki again. With the municipality preparing the grounds, but they don't. And there is, for example, no lines on the pitch. Uh, what do you do, Abdullah, if you get to a field and the pitch is completely unprepared? Uh, Aniki, uh, it is the responsibility of the home side to make sure that the pitch is prepared. So they they need to, I mean, and, um, for many years I belong to a, a cricket club and part of my responsibility was to make sure that the that the um, the person that was preparing the the pitch in this case it was the municipality to make sure either Thursday or Friday I usually kept it till Friday till Friday um, afternoon around about two o'clock just to double check if the pitch was prepared if not we will uh, then contact the person responsible for getting the pitch prepared. So the point I'm trying to make is it's the home side responsibility. When I belong to a club that was actually part of my my duties to double check that the pitch was prepared um, by the by the the contractor. But now let's say in your example, you now get to the ground. Uh, play starts at 10. As per law, you need to be there um, at least 45 minutes before uh, play starts. Some playing conditions want you to be there an hour before play starts. At provincial level, they want you to be there um, 90 minutes before play starts. Now you get there, let's say at half past eight, and you you see the, uh, the ground is not prepared. The pit is not prepared. You need to go speak to the home team. It is their responsibility to have made sure that the pitch um, is prepared. 
And in this case, if the pitch is not prepared, we cannot then play the uh, play the game. We cannot play a game on an unprepared unpre pitch. Um, in the Western Cape, uh, instances like this will go to the mother body governing cricket in the uh, yeah, in the area. Reports needs to be be, uh, be written. The governing body do have a local committee that makes decisions on these these type of things. But to answer your question, no lines. Pitch not prepared when you rock up there on the morning of of Saturday. Um, unfortunately, the game cannot. Um, um, uh, start. No, pitch is not not prepared in Cape Town. It will go to the governing body, and they will then take appropriate action against the home side because it was the home side's responsibility to make sure that the pitch was prepared for the game on the Saturday. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Next question is from Mfundo. He wants to know how much it costs to write the level three exam. So let me just uh, start off by reminding you the level two exam is free for members of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, 100 rands for members of other associations in South Africa. If you're writing with us remotely uh, and then it's 300 rands for members of the general public in South Africa and 500 rands or 30 US dollars for the foreign candidates who wish to write remotely with us. Level three, as I mentioned, will be coming up in uh, June or July and the costs there are a little bit uh, more because the exam for level three is out of 150 marks and it's a three hour exam. So the marking of the papers uh, requires a bit more time uh, from our side. So it is still free for members of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. It is 150 rands for members of other umpires associations in South Africa. And if you are not a member of any association in South Africa, it's 350 rands. And then if you are outside of South Africa, it is 550 rands or 33 US dollars. So those are the costs associated with level three. Uh, but let's take one course at a time, Fundo, and focus on level two for now. Um, Aniki asks, is the game then classified as a draw or a loss for the home side? Uh, Aniki, that is up to the governing body to decide uh, taking all facts into consideration as to why the pitch was not prepared. Uh, there is no specific uh, blanket rule or there could be in the bylaws. Uh, but it would be up to the local leagues committee here in Western Province Cricket Association to decide uh, what the result of that game is for that particular match that couldn't take place because of an unprepared pitch. Uh, Laksh asks, what does level three comprise of? It's very similar to level two. Uh, also covers most of the laws, but not all of the laws, and is out of 150 marks. And uh, again, it will be a closed book exam, and you can write remotely. Um, and it not only uh, focuses on law, but has uh, playing conditions of three-day cricket uh, involved. Uh, but we will get there in level three. Uh, please, guys, do not jump ahead of yourselves. Let's focus on level two for now. Uh, question from Nirav from yesterday's IPL match. Um, Nirav, if it is um, related to any of the laws that we've covered today, then you can ask. If it's going to be related to any of the laws that we're covering in subsequent lectures, then you can ask in those subsequent lectures. Um, that is yes, all. No, I'll, I'll ask it. I'll ask it later. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. 
Um, I'm not going to the um, hands in the um, meeting room. Uh, Taiwo, I see you've got your hand up. Do you have a question for us or is that from uh, the revision questions earlier in the session? Unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Good morning. Hi, Taiwo. Go ahead. Yes, um, I wanted to ask if the visiting team can also al uh, be allowed to prepare the pitch if they had a grand plan in their team. Abdullah, you want to uh, comment on that? You did mention that uh, the opposing team is um, well within their rights to help uh, getting a pitch ready. Uh, yes, Tawa. By all means, uh, anyone can assist to get the game, the game of cricket, or to get the game, uh, you know, started. Home side, anyone of the uh, home side, including the the visiting side, they can assist in any way to get the uh, game uh, uh, started. I mean, I uh, I had a game where there was no we. We had to remark the lines. There was no paint available. The away team wanted the game to take place. So they actually got in their car. One of the members got in their car, went to one of the the, the hardware stores, bought a, uh, a tin of, of, of white paint to remark the creases to make sure that this game gets, uh, gets done. So to answer your question, by all means, to get the game of cricket uh, playing, and if you know both sides, um, they want to get the game uh, um, started. Um, both sides can assist. Over, Tom. Perfect, Dilla. Um, happened in my game as well, where uh, the visiting side um, wanted to play more than the home side wanted to play, and uh, the square was uh, damp, and we had to work hard to get the square. Um, ready and in condition that it wasn't dangerous or unreasonable for play to take place. So the away side went and they bought Hessian for us to roll the square with Hessian to be able to dry it and make it playable. So definitely anything to get the game started, both teams are allowed to help and they are encouraged to help. Um, but it is, like Abdullah mentioned earlier, the responsibility of the home side to have a field prepared. So if a field is not prepared, then the home side will be investigated by the governing body as to why the field and pitch were not prepared. And uh, the match could be awarded to the uh, visiting side, uh, but that is for the governing body to decide, not for us umpires to decide. What we can do is we can take pictures of the pitch and the field uh, to submit as evidence to the governing body for them to make that decision. So, ladies and gentlemen, I do not see any further questions in the chat box, um, but the hand that is still up is the old hand, so I'm going to lower your hand. There are now no more hands up in the group. And so I would like to thank you all for your participation and your interaction uh, for today's lecture. I will be sending out a recording of this lecture in the next couple of hours, and it will be loaded onto our YouTube channel. A reminder to please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't yet done so. And we shall reconvene again next week, Saturday on the 8th of April, same time, same place. We shall be going through laws 12, 13, 14 and 17. Enjoy your week and we shall chat soon. Thank you and good day to you all. Bye bye. -bye. Uh, bye, everyone. Have a good weekend. Yeah, bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.